when tasers were introduced a few years ago, the objective of the taser introduction was not as a compliance device, but to prevent people being shot and killed. Has, the, has that failed, basically, after the recent events? Uh, no, I don't think so. And in fact, uh, tasers are used about 1,200 times a year throughout the state. Um, and in 80% of the use of tasers by our police, uh, it is merely the threat of a police officer drawing a taser, which, can, which gets compliance from the people concerned. But the taser is only one small component of our whole use of force continuum. The, pr the primary role of our police is to, wherever possible, to de-escalate and resolve a violent situ confrontation situation. First, in these circumstances, rather than guns drawn. No, that's an important question. Unfortunately, these matters are now before the coroner. Now, I'm not trying to be uh, to use that as a way of not answering your questions, but the coroner is in charge of these investigations and the information that surrounds them. So I'm unable to talk about the specific details. But what I can say to you is simply this: if someone's running at you with a knife, and they're two metres away. Trying to shoot them with a taser is not, is not the sensible option. It's a, and certainly we provide a series of use of force options for our police and we allow them to make the best decision to, for the most reasonable and lawful and appropriate use of force which is necessary to resolve that particular situation. So know you, Commissioner, that one or more of these recent incidents may have been either suicide by police or copycat incidents because of the recent run. This is something that obviously uh, we are considering um, and certainly um, that factor has not been, um, we've certainly considered it. Um, however, any decision about that will be made on the basis of all of the facts and that is the job of the coroner, the independent arbiter in these matters. You've expressed obviously confidence in the services training while announcing a review. Are there any instances or, or parts of it off the top of your head that need to be looked at specifically that you think could or should be improved or done better off the top of your head before the review commences? Uh, no. Um, I think that, um, you know, people say things like, well, why don't we, why don't we have firearms training more? Why don't we have um, more taser training? Why don't we have more capsicum, uh, use of capsicum training? These are only small components of our whole use of force curriculum. Um, I believe that we have uh, a wonderful training system in that regard, but the, the catch is always this, that somewhere in the world there will be someone with a slightly better view, a slightly better way of doing things, and that's what we need to search out. We need to be looking always uh, for that to improve what we do, because at the end of the day, we never want to use lethal force as a police department. I mean, that is the very last resort. Um, but the situations that our people are faced with, as I said, on a daily basis, and if you think about it, over half a million triple zero calls to Queensland Police each year. That's the current stats. Um, millions of interactions that we have with the public every day. Um, and sadly, though, we still have those very rare occasions where uh, the use of lethal force is necessary. But are you worried about what the public is beginning to think? How, how, how are you receiving uh, members of the public speaking to you about these incidents? I mean, three in a week. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today telling you that I'm going to take all of these actions if I, if I wasn't concerned about the trust relationship that is absolutely critical to the Queensland Police Service doing its job on a daily basis. That's why I'm here. What I am saying is please understand and put this in the context of the broader environment in which we're operating. I mean, it should, it should not be a secret to any of you uh, that in Australia now, we have the highest level of alert for counter-terrorism that we've ever faced in our history. In this, and that's right across Australia. Um, daily, we are seeing issues involving mental health. Daily, we are seeing issues involved polydrug use. Uh, our people need to be equipped to handle all of those to be ready to respond to keep the community safe and secure in all of those situations. Do you think that alert that came out a couple of months ago, combined with the decision for all uniformed officers to be carrying weapons, mm. do you think that's played any part in these incidents for police to reach first for their firearms? Uh, 
The honest answer to that is uh, I don't. However, um, the coroner is going... I suspect that the coroner will look at all of those issues, um, and so the coroner should. I think it's very important that they look at the entire environment that we're operating at the moment. Um, I ask our people to be hypervigilant hyper uh, at the moment. Not, and I said this before G20, this wasn't just about G20. This was about our current working environment. It is important that all police, all sworn officers are ready to deploy to any situation that they're confronted by or that their workmates are confronted by. That is our sworn duty. So uh, I don't believe that simply preparing our officers to be uh, deployable, to be ready to handle any situation has had that impact. But other people will no doubt look at that and they'll have their views. G20, which um, during one security briefing I was told that the police were trained up to the G20 but not given much downtime before the G20. These, ha these incidents have happened post G20. Just taking Michael's point about the readiness, could, is that a factor that could be playing in here as well, that some police are just so wide in readiness for something that they've pulled the guns? Uh, no, because quite honestly I think uh, we've been in this state of higher readiness uh, probably for about 12 months. I don't think that that, I really don't think that's been a factor, but then again, um, there will be an in independent review of all of this, which we will cooperate with. Um, and I'm glad to see Ian Levers here in the room today, uh, because I think Ian and I are on the same page in this, uh, in this space. Any, any review of what is occurring within our community, um, in how we're trained to respond to that, in the way that we provide for the safety and security of the, of the community entirely. I think is an important thing that we both support. Commissioner, you mentioned about 1,200 times a year tasers being deployed or pulled out. Has there been any figure of the average use of guns being pulled out? Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the last five years we have uh, we've been involved in 13 shootings, so that's since 2010, and only in six of those occasions have the outcome been a fatal uh, fatality. Um, Commissioner, so, 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 sorry, just to clarify, that includes these recent five incidents. It does. Yeah. The, uh, but sorry, can I be very clear on this? I'm talking about the times where we've actually shot yeah. at people. So, 13 shootings where we've shot at people in the last five years, only six of those have been fatal. Commissioner, and that includes at the recent spate. Sorry. Yes, it does. So, Queensland Police are looking. Uh, they announced earlier this year that um, big changes to the ethical standards command and. Um, police discipline. Will this still go ahead given this new review as well? Uh, the Ethical Standards Command, I think, um, has benefited from the changes that we've made where we have a far greater range of, of um, staff and the skills base of staff in the Ethical Standards Command. Uh, certainly that is, um, that has been, I think, um, a, major, uh, a major advantage to us uh, in these current matters. Um, the discipline process is an ongoing uh, discussion with government and with the unions. You mentioned there about the uh, coronial uh, inquest. Will, will, is your understanding that the coroner will look at these in combination, or will they be individuals? And when will that be? Because obviously, if there's a if there's a situation now, we don't want to wait 12 months for a coronial inquest to get underway. You're right. And you might notice that in my statement about the actions that we intend to take is not only will we support the coronial inquiries, if the coroner was to ask me for extra resources, I would happily give them to try and make sure that we get these particular matters dealt with very quickly. I think that that is very important for the entire community. Um, uh, certainly, I, I have been in touch with the coroner today, and I believe that the coroner uh, will be looking at uh, doing a joint uh, inquiry of all of these matters, but that is quite properly something that uh, perhaps you should ask him. You mentioned you're wearing a white ribbon for White Ribbon Day. Yes, um, I am. A lot of these incidents seem to be related to domestic violence, is that right? Um, look, can I ask that um, we keep these matters separate? I'm doing some White Ribbon Day um, media later this morning, well, sorry, later today in the, in the Queen Street Mall, and I'd ask you to keep those questions uh, about White Ribbon Day, because I, I don't want the importance of White Ribbon Day to be lost in the discussion that we're having about these incidents. So in terms of domestic violence, uh, these, quite a few incidents, uh, these incidents are related to domestic violence. Some of them are. Well, so, some of them are. Well, will your officers, do, do they need more training on handling these situations? Is that, is that a factor? Um, our officers um, uh, get significant training 
um, across a whole range of, of uh, issues um, and situational, um, um, situational um, incidents. Uh, we do a lot of scenario training with our officers now um, and certainly any, any violent or highly charged situation like a domestic situation where the violence is involved, um, a road rage incident, um, uh, you know, a brawl at a pub, all of these are things that our people have to deal with. Um, almost on a, not, oh, sorry, all of our people have to deal with these and these are occurring across Queensland on a daily basis. So um, we don't specify particular instances. What we do is we specify behaviours and how best to deal with those behaviours. You mentioned that you're going to open the, the, the access to training for the media and the community so they can see what's going on. Absolutely. There. Is that because you don't think there's enough understanding of uh, proximity uh, issues? Like I think the FBI call it the 21 foot rule. Um, you're absolutely right, and thank you. That's an important issue, and that's exactly why I intend to uh, open the doors of our academies to groups of people who can come in and start to understand the complexity of what our people are facing. See, it's not just about someone running down the driveway at you with a knife extended, screaming at you that they're going to cut you into two. It's not just that. It's understanding, if you, if you have time, what... What is the state that this person is? Why are they acting in this way? What has been the causal factors for them reaching this level of aggression? Um, what is your backup? Are you able to retreat safely? I mean, all of these factors play a part in how we deal with these high-risk situations. It's not just about standing firm and, you know, pulling out a baton or a gun or whatever. There are a whole lot of, of variables that our people have to consider at the time. But ultimately, it's about their safety, the community's safety, and the safety of the person with the knife as well. Is increased drug use a factor in these cases? Violent? I, I think the complexity of what our people face uh, on a daily basis has changed. Um, and it's not just the CT environment, the, the um, counterterrorism environment. It is the fact that um, daily we see people with um, the impact of poly drug use on them either right then or over a period of time. Um, as we see with, um, you know, mental, Ill mental illness and the way that that impacts on our society. I think our people are dealing with the consequences of a whole range of important social issues. And, um, and this is always the balance for governments. Do you pour money into having more police with all of the extra equipment or do you pour money into things like, um, you know, rehabilitation programs and what have you? Um, ultimately, it is your police that get called to deal with the consequences when, when people are in trouble, when people are the next door neighbours, you know, going off uh, the handle, uh, being violent, make it damaging property. That's when the police get called. We're at the end of the chain. And uh, part of it is making sure that our primary focus is to try and resolve peacefully any situation we can. But at the same time, um, sometimes that's just not possible. He talks about how the nature of policing is more and more complicated, more and more challenging. It is. If that's the case, why do police not have standard issue body-worn cameras and why is such a, a large percentage of police having to go out and purchase these devices themselves because the QPS isn't doing it? No, it's a very good question. Um, and there's a precedent for this. Uh, when I was a young detective uh, a number of years ago now, um, I went out and I bought myself a a small digital recorder. It wasn't a digital recorder in those days, it was a little tape, we didn't have digital recorders. But I did that way before uh, I was asked to or whether, when the police department itself decided to move to that. And what it reflects is the fact that um, I can put body-worn cameras on, on a lot of people, but it's not going to stop people being shot dead. That's the reality of it. It will record frame by frame what occurred, and yes, we'll be able to review that. But my focus has always been looking at ways that we can actually prevent us ever getting to that stage. That's, that's clearly it. Do I think that we will ultimately have um, body-worn recording devices that will record audio and video? I think we will down the track, but there is still a whole lot of complications uh, in dealing with that as an organisation. Um, and I encourage our officers to go out and buy their own. Um, but ultimately, um, once, once I start to buy them, there are a whole range of issues that um, come into play, not the least of which is the complications about losing police off the road when they have to sit down and classify six or eight hours worth of video. They have to then um, 
uh, not just classify it, but, re but download it. Um, and technology is not just, whilst it's wonderful, it's not quite there yet. Um, I see a time where, you know, Google Glasses um, will probably be part of the answer, that type of technology. Because, as you know, um, if I look over here, what's happening over there is not captured on what's occurring with a very one video, video that's pointing that way. So if you, if you see where I'm coming from, where I just don't think that, we're, that, the, that the technology is quite as mature yet as when we're going to need to put it in more globally across the organisation. But we're looking at it. We're looking at it all the time and we're, and we're reaching out. And I know, um, uh, and I know that Ian uh, from the union has been very vocal about this and I understand that. But I, I hope that um, he will be prepared to also understand my views about um, what this might mean into the future. Sorry, a lot of there's a lot of com complexities, and this might not happen again for you know two or three years. Would you explain this recent spate as being just a sad, um, a coincidence? Uh, I would never try and explain that to you or to the community. The, every one of these is a tragedy in their own right. Um, I said before that, um, and I meant it. Um, none of our people go to work with the idea that they're going to shoot someone. I mean, that is the least, um, you know, the least thing that they think of when they go to work. Um, but uh, when you see uh, the fact that we've had four fatal shootings in, in a small uh, space of time in reality, um, even though, in my view, these are relatively rare occurrences, I think it's my duty to go to the public and reassure them that we're going to look at all of these issues to make sure that there's no specific issue that's impacting on us right now and perhaps to prevent that occurring into the future. Um, we always are looking for better ways of doing things and it's really, really important that I, that I reassure the public that we're taking this very, very seriously. How many of these deaths are classified as deaths in custody? Uh, all of them. A police shooting is a death in custody. How are the police officers? Have you spoken to them? Uh, no, I haven't personally spoken to all of the ones who are involved in all of these incidents. I tend to wait just a short period of time um, because they become quite overwhelmed and, and it's a fact of life that we often lose the officers from the organisation over time and you probably personally know of, of examples of that. Um, but, I, but my message is clear to every one of the men and women of the Queensland Police Service. Uh, I have confidence in them, I trust them, I believe that they have good training, I believe that they honestly go out there with the best intentions on behalf of the community every day. Um, and it's important that they know that because I do not want them taking an extra second to make a decision that's so important um, tomorrow or the next day or the week after that. I ask them just to do their job and to be confident uh, in their training, to be confident in their equipment, to be confident in the fact that the leadership of this organisation and I think the general public support them when they do the right thing. Um, I don't want them waiting that extra half a second because that could cause their death. Commissioner, you said there's going to be a review of um, procedures and training. Um, who's going to be doing that review and are you going to be looking at the use of force uh, model as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, we, will, we will mount an internal review firstly, but we will also look for international best practice and there are um, a number of people who uh, we believe uh, uh, come from uh, policing academia um, who uh, have a significant interest and expertise in this area and we'll reach out to them. We'll also reach out to perhaps experts in the use of force and that could be people from wind policing, it may be the ADF as well. So uh, we, we have an open mind on that at the moment um, but I'll keep you up to date as, as we progress it. Five police shootings in the last two months, four of them fatal. When was the last time that rate was so high? Uh, well, I can't answer that because I can only go back five years at the moment. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, sorry, if I could say just this. This is our 150th year. I am sure that if we go back right back to the start of that, there will have been um, fatal shootings by police officers all, all through that time. And I think it reflects the society, um, the society that we're in. There are those in society, for whatever reason, um, who... Uh, choose to have violent confrontation with um, authority figures, in this, in this case the police department. And, um, and certainly uh, that history is there. What I, what I do want to make clear to everyone is that whilst each is a tragedy, um, these are very rare in reality. 
and that's the truth of it. And I think the figures bear that out when you think about the number of times we actually work with the community every year. And when I say, you know, millions of interactions, I'm talking about every incident we go to, uh, every street arrest, um, every violent brawl, every um, road rage situation, every break and enter, uh, every, every time, you know, a young group of people speed off in a car and we've, you know, and we try to stop them hurting themselves. Every one of those, um, every one of those violent confrontations that we, we get involved in, the fact that there has only been 13 times in the last five years where, we've, where police officers have had to shoot to preserve their lives um, or the life of someone else in the community and the fact that we've only had six fatalities, I think, I think that actually says loads about the professionalism of your police department. How does that compare to other states? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have comparative figures on, on what happens in other states. Um, uh, but certainly, I'm sure that any review, that's something we will look at uh, as we move forward. Victoria had a reputation for a while where the police were trigger happy. Are they concerned that the public may think that about Queensland? Uh, look, I would hope not. Um, uh, there was a situation in Victoria at one stage uh, where they developed a, a project called Project Beacon. They did a lot of work. They retrained their whole police department. Um, I don't think we've seen that sort of issue since then. Um, we actually had a, a project just after that called Project Lighthouse, which took, um, took cognizance of what was happening in Victoria, and that has formed part of our development of our strategy. So I'm going back to the mid-90s now. Um, and we've come a long way. Um, certainly our training continues to evolve and the scenario training that we now do, that we've been doing for a couple of years, that, that actually started about 90, uh, 20, 2005 and we built on that until we've actually implemented that scenario training. Um, so what I'm saying is we are clearly always reviewing what we do but I think it's important to have a specific project right now to make sure that we don't have an outlier, a, a factor that perhaps we hadn't seen. Uh, previously um, that we need to address um, and we will address it if, if we find that. Does the communication between various agencies need to be improved so that police called out to these hostile jobs are perhaps given more background information with what they could be confronting? Thank you because that's a really really important point and um, uh, it is an area that I'm passionate about and um, the, you might know about our QLight project so that's the iPads our officers have. Um, I'm hopeful that um, by rolling them out right across the organisation, we will achieve just that. We will allow our people um, to get better information uh, about the uh, environment they're about to walk into, where that information exists. Now, it's not a perfect world and we won't always have that information, but sometimes we will, and it will make it safer for officers to be able to get that information instantaneously as they get the job. And they can say, wow, I've, I've got to think about these other things going in the, in the front door or going up the driveway, or just pulling up near the house. This is, this is the, the best that we can get to. Are we there yet? Excuse me. Are we there yet? No, we're not, but we're getting better. Part of this also is the ability to interact with other government agencies and other, and other support agencies who are perhaps um, non-government agencies and have that inner, inner change of, of information. That will make our community a safer place, I'm absolutely sure, and we're working towards that. Ladies much. and gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for today. I really appreciate you coming in at short notice. I appreciate the fact that Ian Levis is here from the union. I think it's really, really important that um, we together, um, uh, and with the Commission Officers Union as well, uh, we demonstrate that we are taking this very seriously. Uh, we'll do everything we can to um, get back that confidence that we need from the community. So thank you very much for your part in that.